Someone has once said that judging others is the Christian's favorite indoor sport. If that is the case, then believers are playing the most dangerous game imaginable. Why? Because God loves his people. He cares deeply about those whom he has given to his son. Scripture tells us that he is jealous for them. And the son himself is, is no different. Uh, not only is he interested in the care and safekeeping of his own, but Jesus, we, we discover as we read scripture, he, he prescribes the, the harshest measures on those who would harm his people. But listen to what he says in Matthew chapter 18, the first six verses of that chapter. We're told that at that time the disciples came to Jesus and said, Who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And, and Jesus called a child to himself and set him before them. And he said, Truly I say to you, unless you are converted and become like children, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. And whoever humbles himself as this child, he is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoever receives one such, uh, such, uh, one such child in my name receives me. But whoever causes one of these little ones, one of my children, those who believe in me, if they cause them to stumble, it would be better for him to have a heavy millstone hung around his neck and to be dropped into the depth of the sea. I mean, that's subtle. The Lord Jesus prescribes the harshest of sentence on those who would cause his children to stumble. And those who hurt God's children should expect the most severe punishment. And the Apostle Paul seems to be keenly aware of this, this truth when he wrote his epistle to the Roman church. I say this because the, the writer spends really the balance of, of the latter part of his text teaching believers how they are to interact with one another, lest they harm those whom God the Father has given to his Son. Recognizing that the church is a collection of different people from different ethnic and, and religious backgrounds, uh, recognizing that while these people have been brought together through a common faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, that they... They come with a whole host of different and, and competing perspectives. Paul has, has written Romans chapter 14 to teach believers how to interact with one another. To do, an, it's a, to do so in a way that honors God and, and shows a, a healthy regard for his children. The biblical text is clear on the fundamentals of the faith. We know that. We know that Paul has explicitly taught the Christian doctrine throughout this epistle. And yet, as we come to this particular text, Paul shows us that there are many areas where Scripture is silent or its testimony is muted. That there are many gray areas in the Christian life that where we need to exercise wise discernment. We need to exercise our own judgment. And that's what we've been looking at in, in this kind of this final portion of, of Paul's text. Uh, last, week, we, last week when we looked at the first 12 verses of, uh, of Romans 14, we discovered that when it comes to doubtful things, when it comes to matters of personal opinion, Believers are not to worry about others, they're to worry about themselves. And again, Paul is not describing those areas where scripture is clear, where, where God says do this or, and don't do that. Uh, he is not opening the floodgates to, to all kinds of sin and licentiousness. No, he is, he is, he is describing those matters where there is no explicit teaching. So last, last week, we saw that when it comes to these debatable matters, we are not to worry about others, we're to worry about ourselves. 
Well, if, if Paul had stopped there, it would almost seem to be that Paul was admonishing us to go through life alone, isolated from, from one another, uh, to live at arm's length. Uh, we might be or come to the conclusion that it would be better to leave each other alone and let the, the, the weak remain in their, their weakened condition. Thankfully, Paul does not leave us with that impression because he continues his discussion. Uh, he presents us in the text that we're going to look at this morning uh, with the, uh, a second admonition, one that encourages believers to live life together. And we need to do so in a way that helps and not hinders uh, the spiritual development of those around us. So please turn in your Bibles, open your Bibles, and let's turn uh, to Romans chapter 14. And this morning we're going to focus our attention on uh, verses uh, 13 to the end of the chapter. Verses 13 to 23. In these verses we'll discover that when it comes to matters of one's personal opinion, the stronger believer needs to help and not hinder the weak. So let's stand for the reading of God's word together. Romans chapter 14, beginning at verse 13. Paul writes, Therefore, therefore let us not judge one another anymore, but rather determine this, not to put an obstacle or a stumbling block in a brother's way. I know and am convinced in the Lord Jesus that nothing is unclean in itself. But to him who thinks anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. For if because of food your brother is hurt, you are no longer walking according to love. Do not destroy with your food him for whom Christ died. Therefore, do not let what is for you a good thing be spoken of as evil. For the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness and peace and, and joy in the Holy Spirit. For, who, he, for he who in this way serves Christ is acceptable to God and approved by men. So then, we pursue the things which make for peace and the building up of one another. Do not tear down the work of God for the sake of food. All things indeed are clean, but they are evil for the man who eats and gives offense. It is good not to eat meat or to drink wine or to do anything by which your brother stumbles. The faith which you have, have as your own conviction before God. For happy is he who does not condemn himself in what he approves. But he who doubts is condemned if he eats because his eating is not from faith. And whatever is not from faith is sin. This is the word of the Lord. Let's bow together. Father, we stand in your presence through Christ by the Holy Spirit. In doing so, we honor you as the, the triune God, uh, the supreme being who stands above and over all things. We come before you as the church, the bride which you have given to your son, the Lord Jesus Christ, that which he purchased with his own blood. We come as, as those who want to express their, their thanks and their gratitude through a life of obedience. And so we ask now that you would, you would teach us through the ministry of your Holy Spirit, that he would help us to understand the, the text before us, so, so that not only might we live as you have called us to live, uh, as, a, as a body that is united in and through the Lord Jesus Christ, but so that we might please you in all that we do together. We ask this in Christ's most precious name. Amen. Thanks, brothers and sisters. Please be seated. I've really uh, already I, uh, presented you with our big idea for this morning. Um, 
I've already stated that when it comes to one's personal opinion, stronger believers uh, need to help and not hinder the weak. Uh, and I've been somewhat deliberate in, in that wording. Um, according to the Apostle Paul, there are two basic groups of individuals that exist within a, any congregation. It's, that is not a, a regional thing. Uh, that is not a historical thing. This has been a reality that has ex been expressed uh, throughout all of church history, in, in all churches, everywhere. And it's the fact that there are those who are weak in the faith. Uh, those whose conscience has been bound to observe uh, certain traditions and practices that are really no longer binding on the believer. Uh, they may be simply immature in, in that way. It, it may be that they understand uh, the gospel message. These are true believers. But they haven't worked out the implications of that in, their, in the course of their daily life. And then there are the strong. Uh, these are the ones who have learned uh, how to enjoy their freedom in, in Christ. They, uh, they are not compelled to, to restrict themselves to certain foods, or they, they don't feel obligated to uh, observe certain days or festivals. They, they recognize that God has given them all good things to enjoy. And recognizing that these two groups are approaching life from almost two opposite perspectives. Uh, Paul puts the onus on the strong, and on the strong in particular. Uh, those who are, are mature, uh, to, to cultivate a sense of, of wholeness within the congregation. Uh, that's not to say that the, the weaker brethren have no part to play in this. They do, but the, the lion's share of this responsibility, it, it falls to the strong. Those who understand the implications of, of the gospel and their newfound freedom in Christ. And so as we move through the text, we'll see that God uh, calls believers, uh, strong believers, uh, to embrace four truths. Four truths that the apostle has presented in this text. Truths that are meant to help us, at, uh, enable us to help those around us and not to hinder them in their spiritual growth and development. Well, in, in verses uh, 13, 14, and 15, Paul begins really at the ground level. Uh, this is kind of the most fundamental step. It, this, is, this is the elementary truth that we need to understand, uh, and everything else is going to be built on this. And it's here in, in these first three verses that Paul wants the believer to recognize that we always impact those around us, that we don't live in isolation, uh, that we're not disconnected but from the people sitting beside us or in front of us or in back of us. It, no, there's always going to be some ripple effect uh, by us being in the congregation. So look at what Paul says in verses 13, 14, and 15. He says, therefore, let us not judge one another anymore, but rather determine this, not to put an obstacle or a stumbling block in a brother's way. He says, I know and am convinced in the Lord Jesus that nothing is unclean in itself, but to him who thinks anything unclean, to him it is unclean. For if because of your food your brother is hurt, you are no longer walking according to love. So do not destroy with your food him for whom Christ died. I mean, these words are remarkable. Particularly when you think about the man who spoke them. I mean, these are the words of a man who was once a Pharisee. Uh, he was a member of the separate ones. Uh, he was in the upper echelon of, of Hebrew society. It, it was a small but highly revered group. Uh, Paul tells us that he lived according to the strictest sect of the Hebrew religion. And that in, in his former way of life, he exercised great caution, great concern about the things that he ate and drank. He was very mindful about his, his actions and his associations. Then he met the Lord. And came to the understanding 
an appreciation of his instruction to the Apostle Peter. We're given Peter's vision in Acts chapter 10, a daydream in which the Lord appears to the Apostle and he calls him to rise up and to kill and to eat all kinds of four-footed animals and 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 crawling creatures and 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 we read that Peter refused to do this not not once but three times and yet each time the Lord responds to his obstinate servant and he says this he says what God has cleansed no longer consider unholy Paul this Pharisee this separate one This man who sought to make himself holy from everyone else around him. He seems to get this point very early in his ministry. He's come to understand that no person or place or thing is unclean in and of itself. That's the truth as God has declared it. And yet Paul recognizes that others within the church, they are struggling to come to grips with this reality. Moreover, he understands that his response to this revelation, uh, his and that of his stronger brethren, it, it could it could adversely affect those around them. Notice the word that Paul uses in this section. He speaks of placing an obstacle or a stumbling block in the path of a believer. One of the words that he uses here, the obstacle, I I believe it is, is it refers to a bait stick, a death stick. It's kind of one of those pressure pressure traps that if someone hits that that, that stick, it's going to cause the rock to come down and and, and to, to splatter the head of the animal or the unsuspecting victim. The obstacle is just something that is laying in the road. There may not be any sort of intention there, but it just so happens that it's there to, to trip the individual up. Paul refers to both of these. The, the intentional stumbling block, or the intentional object, the unintentional object. Then he speaks of the, the hurt, the trauma that is caused. He suggests that the weaker brother may be destroyed. It's a term that refers to ruin. Not, not the annihilation of something, but a complete and utter devastation of that object or, or, or that person. It's, it's like they've been crippled. They're unable to come back to an original state of being. It's been a loss that's transpired. They've been forever damaged or devastated because a mature saint insists on exercising their freedom, and and does so at the expense of that weaker brother. I mean, these are heavy words. And even though Paul finds himself on on one side of of this issue, I mean, he's he's firmly ensconced himself in that, that, that group of mature believers, the strong believers. You'll notice that he doesn't soften the rhetoric here. No, Paul is going to drive the nails deep. He's not going to let up. Look at how he ends this particular section. Look at the last line of verse 16. He says, do not destroy with your food him for whom Christ died. That that is not just a, a statement of fact. He is making a rhetorical point here. Christ died for this individual. The eternal Son of God took on human flesh. He entered in time and space, taking on the form of a servant. He sacrificed himself. He gave his all. He sacrificed himself for for the sake of others. What then are you willing to sacrifice for your brother or sister in Christ? 
what can you give up in comparison to that? As that thought lingers in the air, Paul encourages the believer then to reevaluate their priorities. We need to value the things that God values. Look at verses uh, 16, 17, and 18. Paul says, Therefore do not let what is for you a good thing be spoken of as evil, for the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Uh, for he who in this way serves Christ is acceptable to God and approved by men. In commenting on this section, Warren Wearsby speaks really from a wealth of experience, and this is what he states. He says, uh, like the, the Pharisees of old, we Christians have a way of majoring in the minor. I have seen churches divided over matters that are really insignificant when compared to the vital things of the Christian faith. I have heard of churches being split over such minor matters as, as the location of the piano in the auditorium or serving meals on Sunday. And yet we read the kingdom of God is not meat and drink. If we as believers are going to act as iron sharpening iron, then we need some direction on this, don't we? We need to know what is important, what needs to be, to be emphasized. And so Paul gives us that much-needed direction in this text. He tells us that the kingdom of God, the, the realm where God's will prevails, that it is not focused on these outward activities. It's not centered on the externals. It doesn't focus on the things we wear or the food we eat, or the particular days of the week that we set aside for, for different activities. No, the work of God is not external. It takes place within. Uh, God has clothed the, the inner man with the, the righteousness of, of Christ. Uh, he has cleansed our soul from every spot and stain so that we might enjoy peace with God and our, and our, and our fellow man. He has filled our hearts with joy through the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit. Referring to this section of the text, Swindoll states, how easy to get hung up on tangible things such as food, habits, clothing, recreation, music, even decoration. The organ of life's richest delights is is not in the stomach, it's, it's the heart. And at the end of the day, we will answer not for what we put into our stomachs, for, but for the attitudes that we have nurtured within. He continues asking this. He says, what is our focus? Are we more concerned with people preferences than the true product of Christian growth, righteousness, peace, and joy? When the outside world peeks through the windows of our church, what do we want them to see? Uh, list makers dashing about enforcing rules while others defiantly ignore them. What a chaotic scene. Who would want that? Apparently Paul doesn't. I know this because of what Paul says in the next section. Uh, rather than hindering those around them, Paul states here that believers need to understand that they have a responsibility to, to help others grow in their Christian walk. That, that's really the aim of verses 19, 20, and 21. And so let's read that text together. Beginning at verse 19. So then we pursue the things which make for peace and for the building up of one another. Do not tear down the work of God for the sake of, of food. All things indeed are clean, but they are evil for the man who eats and gives offense. It is good not to eat meat or to drink wine or to do anything by which your brother stumbles. Notice the force again of Paul's words. These are strong assertions. Do not tear down the work of God for the sake of something so insignificant, for a piece of meat for a ribeye steak, for a morsel of food. Uh, Paul, writing under the, uh, 
the supervision of the Holy Spirit, he calls that kind of activity, he calls it evil. Not not bad. Not maybe you should think a little harder on this. Not that's unwise. He says this is evil. The freedom that the strong believer enjoys then does not give them license to flaunt their liberty. They shouldn't cause animosity within the congregation by by advertising their strength, by, by waving that red flag in front of the bull. That is going to lead to hurt. That is going to lead to destruction. That is evil. And so the believer needs to to be sensitive to the concerns of those around them. But notice how the the writer begins this section. He says, So then we pursue the things which make for peace and for the building up of one another. That's not a statement. That's not a casual request. It's a command, a, a call for some form of deliberate action. And, and I love how R.C. Sproul uh, illustrates this idea. He writes this. He says, when I was three years old, the most exciting toy I received at Christmas uh, was a metal plane in which I could sit and, and pedal around in the streets. It was called a pursuit plane. That was the first time I heard the word pursuit. He says, it was not until much later that I understood that pursuit planes were designed to, to search out and to destroy the enemy. And this is the action that it, Paul is calling us to perform. He says we are to chase after, to, to diligently seek those things that make for peace. As believers, we should be actively seeking to draw the body of Christ together. Not to go our separate ways, but to come together. Uh, Not to to divide by catering to the particular whims of of a smaller segment within the congregation, dividing up preference by preference. Uh, We're not to run a contemporary service for one group and a traditional one for another. We're not going to serve wine for for one group and and grape juice for another. No, we're we're going to pursue Christ as one body. Not as a Frankenstein body. Sewn together here or there. Barely together. We're going to do it as the bride of Christ. Not only that, but we're, we're going to seek to build up one another. Do you realize that what Paul is saying here? The, the, Paul, Paul is not calling the church to maintain the status quo or to, to cater to the lowest common denominator. He is calling for the spiritual growth and, and development of the entire congregation. Build up. Edify. Don't, don't stay as you are. Build. Both the strong believer and the weak believer need to grow. The strong believer needs to grow in love. Uh, They need to be patient with those who have a difference of opinion on these disputable matters. Uh, Rather than indulging in those freedoms in the presence of a weaker brother, they they need to learn how to to set those things aside temporarily or perhaps even permanently for the sake of their brothers and sisters in Christ. That's going to take maturity. Considering someone... Someone else above our own, our, our own interests. Swindoll writes, What you enjoy in the privacy of your home is entirely between you and the Lord. All things are lawful, not all things are constructive. You need to know the difference and to thank God for all the wonderful things that he has created For you to enjoy. When you are in public though. uh, When you are in public. Don't restrict yourself unnecessarily. But be aware of the potential effect. Your actions have on others. Be sensitive to to reactions. And graciously uh, adjust your behavior. Accordingly. 
Understanding that balance is going to take time. It's going to require us to actually get to know one another, to know each other's sensitivities, to understand how we're approaching these areas. We need to grow. And the same really can be said for the weaker brother. The, this believer needs to grow. They, their, their understanding of the gospel needs to, to mature. They need to come to grips with the practical implications of being free in Christ and, and the significance of that for everyday living. They should not remain stagnant. They really need to be constantly going back to the biblical text to challenge their assumptions, to ask, why am I doing the things that I'm doing? Is this just tradition? Has this been forced upon me? They must ask the Lord to give them wisdom, insight into these matters so that they might not be bound by the fetters of legalism. Well, so far, Paul has really done three things. He's communicated three ideas in the text. He began by demonstrating that each of us is going to leave a mark on the people beside us, uh, that no man is an island unto himself, that we're going to have some sort of effect uh, on each other. And because of this, he, he leads us to the second thing, that we really need to get our priorities straight, that we need to value the internal realities of, of the kingdom, that which takes place in the heart. And third, he has told us that we need to grow as the body of Christ. But there's one more principle that Paul wants to highlight in our text this morning. He tells us that in seeking to help and not to hinder others, we need to recognize that we ought not to force our opinions on others. We, we ought not to violate our own conscience. And that seems to be what he is conveying in the last two verses of the text. Look at what Paul says in verses 22 and 23. He says, The faith which you have, have as your own conviction before God. Happy is the one who does not condemn himself in what he approves. But he who doubts is condemned if he eats because he is eating not from faith, and whatever is not of faith is sin. Now, I recognize that Paul does not expressly refer to the believer's con conscience in this text. Um, but that does seem to be his, his focus here. And, and as we looked at, at the previous section in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 8 and, and, and in chapter 10, Paul is speaking about conscience in that, that those texts, he's dealing with a related subject. Uh, he's actually using the same terminology there that he uses here. And so I think it's safe for us to make that link. To draw attention to the believer's conscience. See, God has given each person their own unique conscience. He has implanted this device within every human heart. It is a personal warning system that either affirms or decries our actions and our attitudes. This conscience testifies either uh, for or against the individual. It's a, it's a malleable conscience. It's pliable. It's something that we can sear. Something that can become weak and defiled Paul even says, or in the, the writer to the, of the epistle to the Hebrews says it can even become evil. So here Paul seems to be advocating that we maintain a, a good conscience, uh, that which is clean and, and, and blameless, by not forcing ourselves or others to, to violate what they hold to be right and just and true. Now let me be, be clear, Paul is not advocating a a Jiminy Cricket kind of theology. Uh, you remember the, the little cricket? How when he gave counsel to Pinocchio, he said, you know, just always let your conscience be your guide. That is not in any way, shape, or form biblical counsel. Uh, we all know individuals who can lie at the drop of a hat and feel no compulsion or comp uh, compunction about that whatsoever. Whatsoever. 
Uh, we've all heard about the psychopath who commits unspeakable atrocities and yet they feel no remorse. No, a good conscience is that which is informed and nurtured by the teaching of Scripture. And as such, the believer is compelled to obey what the, 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 the biblical text clearly prescribes and the conscience being, being constructed according to our own unique appetites and proclivities, again, guided by the teaching of Scripture, is meant to, to point us in the right direction where, where Scripture is sometimes silent. So Paul is calling his readers to respect, uh, to be responsive to the biblically informed conscience. He says that our conviction before God must not be violated. It, 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 it can't be thrust aside. He says if the, the Christian believes something is wrong, they must, be, they, they must not proceed. If there is doubting, don't do it. It's not safe. It means you're headed down the wrong path. Uh, the, the warning lights are flashing. The silent siren is, is blaring. Give heed. He says if you don't feel, basically if we apply this, he's saying if you don't feel comfortable drinking alcohol or, or going to a restaurant on Sunday or, or playing certain kind of games, don't do it. Don't violate your conscience. Don't encourage others to violate theirs. Because simply put, that will lead you into sin. Your job is to be a help and not a hindrance. You are your brother's keeper, your sister's keeper. You can't throw off that responsibility it has been placed upon you by virtue of your adoption into the family of God. So whether you like it or not, we, we are in this together. And yet this is not meant to be a drudgery. This is the blessing of God. This is his provision for the church. as we mutually accept and embrace each other as heirs of God and as fellow heirs of Christ. We were never meant to walk this, this path alone, to live in isolation, to be afraid, constantly worried about what others think of us, whether they're judging our every move, our every action, and Paul is warning us against that. He tells us that we are to help and not to hinder each other, especially when it comes to these matters of personal opinion. So let's take these things to heart and seek to grow together as a church. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you for your word. We thank you for this admonition before us. Father, I ask as we go from this place that you would bring those areas to mind in our own hearts and minds where, where perhaps we have been a little judgmental towards those around us. And Father, that you would cause us to think new thoughts. To take every thought captive. Uh, to be obedient to the teachings of Christ. Uh, to recognize the worth and, and the value of, of uh, each person in this room this morning. To see them as, as your gracious gift. That which is to be nurtured and to develop and to be developed. Uh, th those individuals whom you have placed in our lives to, uh, to take off those rough edges. Individuals whom you have brought into our life to help us be, to be conformed into the image of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Help us not to, to spurn them, but to embrace them, to bring them in close. Uh, Father, we, we ask that you would cause us to be one, even as you and the Son are one. That we would revel in that, that unity, that, 
uh, that closeness with one another. And in doing so, we would pray that we would give you all the honor and glory. In Jesus' name.